Good evening, everyone. We are continuing on our series in Biblical Holy Days, Feasts and Appointments of the Lord. One of the challenges that we have is that many of us talk about this and or listen to many of these uh, feasts being discussed without actually having to go into the text. Uh, and, and our intent is really to bring all of us back to the text itself, uncover the Hebrew, and uh, so that we can have a much better appreciation. Now, as we had begun in each of the sessions, I'd like to draw your attention to the chronology of the texts. As usual, we could see that the book of Genesis is the beginning. And here in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, we have the Sabbath. And so we need to understand the history of the Sabbath. It's, it's, it's very clear to us that it is part and parcel of the seventh day of creation. Now we have a cutoff point at the book of Exodus. Because the book of Exodus begins our story of the narrative of how the nation of Israel came about. But in the meantime, we have 50 chapters of the book of Genesis. And then we have 42 chapters of the book of Job, in which the Sabbath is not talked about and uh, not observed in any particular way. The nation of Israel is not discussed, and neither is the law. And this is a very important point whenever we study the Bible, so that we are able to place the text in its proper time frame. Somewhere in Exodus chapter 12, uh, sorry, in Exodus chapter uh, 19, we have, Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is a very important part because that is where much of the things that we, we spoke about is actually given. And so we had discussed the Sabbath being made into a particular covenant with the nation of Israel. We saw in Exodus chapter 12, the issue of the Passover. And that is also an a, a generational observance. And we saw the last one was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that too is part and parcel of a seven-day celebration. Uh, and it starts with the eating of the Passover. Now today, we are looking at a couple more uh, days within the Holy Calendar. Uh, where it also fits into this context. And the context is very much here. Uh, we are talking about the first fruits. And then we have what we call uh, the, the Feast of Harvest or Weeks. And we will end by looking at... Uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets, or commonly called the Feast of Trumpets. And that would be our scope for today. But more importantly, I want us to really be able to understand that at the end of the day, there's also a post-exile period, where that would be after Babylon, uh, and, and there, there are some feasts that, that came about as well. So let's look at our next three special days. First fruits, the harvest or weeks, and trumpets. As a background for the next couple of uh, feasts and special days, it is important for us now to understand and appreciate the concept of first fruits. First fruits itself is a very important idea 
that is driven by God himself. We saw in Exodus chapter 12 and 13 in particular, where God says, All firstborn is mine, both man and beast. And first fruits are exactly the same intent that God wants Israel or the Israelites to bring first fruits to God. But why? And so the background would be this in chapter 8. In chapter 8 itself, if you look at right here, verse 6, let's read from verse 6. You shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Good land means a land in the eyes of Israel is very fertile. And here it says it's a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, meaning this is an area where there are, there's lots of water. But our attention should be in verse 8. A land of wheat and barley, of vines. When we talk about vines, we're talking about grapes. And then of fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. And by honey, we're talking about dates. Why is this important? Is because in the land of Israel, God is bringing them there that is rich with seven types of agriculture. And the seven types are listed here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. For our purposes today, we are in particular interested in barley and wheat because these are the first fruits that will come in the springtime. And so after the Passover and unleavened bread, which would be towards the later part of March, uh, early April, depending on the calendar, uh, this will come about because barley and wheat will be harvested at this particular time. And so first fruits means this. When they enter into the land, they must realize that their fertility of the land and the bountiful harvest that they have really comes from God. I mean, let's not saying that they didn't plant, but the idea is that rain and water comes from God. It is a land which has no scarcity. And it is important for us now to realize that this is the land that God gave them. And if they are disobedient, water will be turned off. So Deuteronomy chapter 8 gives us that background. And this background today we're looking at is wheat and barley. So let us now go back to our base passage for this series. That is in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Just a quick recap so that we are not missing out on the uh, continuity. These are the feasts of the Lord. And remember all these were the feasts of the Lord. Uh, and these are my feasts. We need to remember that these are not fees, but they are really appointments. And I've highlighted them uh, in, in the previous sessions. And when God gave them the sun, moon, and stars, it is important for them to realize that it is appointments that God is particularly interested in. And God doesn't fix appointments throughout the year, but there are particular days that Israel, as there is a nation under God, as a holy nation, as a special nation, as a nation that will listen to God and obey God, must remember these 
holy convocations that are my appointments, God says. So as appointments go, guess what? It cannot be missed. And that is the intent that I wanted to bring out, that as we look at the biblical text, that we have a better appreciation of why God did what he did. Because God doesn't leave the Israelites all by themselves and let them do what they want. God's land, so let me just put this down. God's land, God's rules. And if they fail to comply by God's rules, then there are consequences. And the worst of the consequences that we do read in the book of Deuteronomy is that they will be evicted or ejected out of the land. And so right now, the appointments of God is the rule, are the rules that God is laying down for Israel. And so we saw the first one being the Shabbat, right? The seventh day is the Shabbat. We saw that in Genesis, but nothing much was talked about except that we understood the concept of the Shabbat. And in God says it is a rest and you must rest and you shall do no work because whenever you, you see these words, do no work, it is the Shabbat of the Lord, the rest of the Lord. And so that is what is important. The seventh day is a Shabbat, a rest. And so you can actually equate Shabbat as rest or Shabbat as weeks, but context is important. We spoke about the Passover and unleavened bread, but for our purposes today, we need to go back and look at this particular day. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. This is also the day they eat the Passover. They kill the Passover. The Lord's Passover is about killing a ram or a he goat of one year and perfect and then the next day, and understand when he says the next day, it is literally in a matter of hours because the, the, the animal is actually killed at sunset or twilight towards the sun setting of the day. And once you pass the sunset, that would be the next day. That would be the 15th day. And every time the Hebrew day begins, they actually begin with a meal. And that would be eating the Passover. But our interest today would be this. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation and you shall do no customary work. And what is do no customary work? It is a rest. It is a Sabbath. Right? It is a Sabbath. And when is it the Sabbath again? Well, the seventh day, right? We have the first day and the seventh day. It's the same. Do no customary work. It's another rest and another Sabbath. And this is why I want to bring our attention. Just remember that. Verse 9. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak. Now in verse 10, when he says, speak to the children of Israel, it would be to say something to them. When you come into the land is the condition. Right here. Understand this, that in Leviticus, and this is Leviticus chapter 23, and in verse 10, it says, when you come into the land which I shall give you, means that this is not happening when they are in the wilderness. The reason being is that it is not possible. The reason being is that they are not stopping anywhere long enough to do agriculture. That's, that's the part here. And so 
what you do is that when you come into the land that God is giving and you reap its harvest, meaning you've planted something and then it comes the time to harvest. That's what it means here. And then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And this is what I want to draw your attention. A sheaf. The word sheaf is omer. And you should remember the Hebrew word omer is a way of calculating, a way of sizing up the harvest. And in this harvest, it would be very similar or very akin to a stock. And then with the stock, we have the, the first fruits, right, all around it. And so you probably have a number of it. So a number of sheep. And around it will be the, 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 the first fruits that is ripe. And what they do is that they would tie, uh, I guess, a reed, right? Uh, well, in today's terms, you'll be tying a string, but they, they would use a, a, a reed. A reed would be a kind of plant that is very robust and you can actually make knots with it. And the second thing about this particular first fruits, so it's a is a sheaf tie up a bunch of it, the first fruits of your harvest. Now, the word first fruits here in verse 10 is the beginning. The beginning of your harvest. And now, in this particular beginning of the harvest, we're talking about the barley. Because the barley comes before the wheat. But this whole period would be harvesting. All right? And so the first of these fruits at this point in time, it is to be brought to the priests, the Kohen. And understand, all first fruits are brought to the priests. And there is a ritual that the priest is supposed to do. And so he will wave the Omer before the Lord. And so it is one whole bunch and he will shake it to the left and right, up and down. And it will be accepted on your behalf. So this is a ritual that's done by the Kohen, the priest. And this, unfortunately, we have always been referring to this to the Feast of First Fruit, but it's not a feast at all. Not at all, right? It is a particular day where the first fruits are brought. And so there are a number of days where first fruits are brought to the Lord. Because every time you have first fruits, it must be brought to the Lord first. And so when is it due? On the day after the Sabbath. And this Sabbath is understood by the Jews. Now, not myself, but this is what I understand, that the Jews take this as the day after the first day of unleavened bread and so this is the day after the first day of unleavened bread and so this would be the second day of the unleavened bread and the priest shall wave it and so this is a ritual that's done that way the reason why it's understood is because that this refers to a very specific rest which is the first day of unleavened bread. Remember, no customary work, as well as the seventh day. And so the day after would be the second day of unleavened bread. And then on that day, you shall do this, right? You, you shall offer on that day weigh a wave of the sheaf and then a male lamb of the first year. Now look at verse 12. This one here is, uh, instead, well, you can call it a male lamb, right? A male lamb is actually correct. A male lamb is actually called a ram, right? And it is a, it's a very young ram. It's in the first year. Very similar to the Passover animal, right? Very similar to the Passover animal. And it says, without blemish means what? 
it is not blind, it is not uh, lame, it is not wounded. You know, that is what it means without blemish. In other words, complete or perfect. And this lamb or ram, if you want to call it that, uh, is offered as a burnt offering to the Lord. Now, we don't have time to go into what is a burnt offering. A burnt offering is a very important part of the ritual. And so in verse 12, this word burnt offering is ola. This is one word, by the way. Ola means something that is, I guess, something that is set up, uh, something that is ascending. And so when you burn the offering with the fat in it, then there will be smoke that rises up to God and the aroma of the fat that goes up is called an ola, a burnt offering. And I would draw your attention to Leviticus chapter 1 for this description. So it is best that you go back and read and we won't be dealing with it today. And that would be the burnt offering. Now the next offering here, is a grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah or fine flour, and it's made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. This is the second, and this would be in Leviticus chapter two, right? Leviticus chapter two, uh, and and the next one here is a drink offering. We have wine, one-fourth of a hin, and, and all these are measurements also in Leviticus, right? Leviticus. I think this would be in chapter 2 to 3, if I'm not mistaken. So something for us to look at because chapters 1 to 7 covers all forms of um, offerings. Now, what is important is the next verse, in verse 14. It says, You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the day you have brought an offering to the Lord your God. And notice this it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And what does this mean? It means olam, just like. Passover, unleavened bread, and the Sabbath, it is a statute, it is a law, it is something that they must do in every generation, not just this one, and wherever you dwell. And this would be the first of the first fruits. And all first fruits belongs to the uh, the priests, right? It belongs to the priests. And it's important for us to understand. And so let me just point you to Deuteronomy, right? Deuteronomy. And in chapter 26, and so we will look at this, Deuteronomy chapter 26 is about first fruits to the Levites or to the priests, actually. To the priests. Sorry. And I will leave that to you to go back and read Deuteronomy 26 about first fruits. And this is important. All right. And so we are looking at the day after the first day of unleavened bread, which is the Sabbath. Next, we have the Feast of Weeks. And here it is to be counted. Now, in verse 15, the word count literally means to uh, enumerate. I guess you can say that, enumerate. Count, right? It's a, it's a simple word. It's it's good, good name, good word to use. So you count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, and just now I had mentioned that this is the first day of unleavened bread. And so the day after the Sabbath would be the 
second day of unleavened bread. From the day that you brought that Omer, Omer, of the wave offering. Now, what are you supposed to count? Count seven Shabbats to be completed. So you must count seven Shabbats, and it's understood as seven seventh days or seven weeks. That would be the meaning of the Shabbat, right? But there is a second item here. It says, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Now, this is important for us to understand. And so I want to pause here and to demonstrate how significant is the counting. We are taking a pause in verse 16 and let us go to a calendar. Now, in this calendar, now, because I'm not a Jew, I'm not an expert in the count. I'm just trying to demonstrate to you the importance that Israel has to be very careful in the count. And so in March 2021, the Sabbath falls on this date. The Passover, sorry. The Passover falls on this uh, This is the uh, 14th of Nisan. Right? This is the day where you have the Passover, the killing of the Passover is here, and the eating of the Passover will be here. And this will be the first day of the unleavened bread all the way here. Now, because we're not going to draw it this way, just understand that it's from sunset to sunset. And this would be the next day of the... Well, how should we call it? The, the day after the Sabbath, right? And this would be the first day of unleavened bread. And this is the second day of unleavened bread. And this is the day where we start the count. Now, the second thing that we need to remember is that there needs to be at least seven Sabbaths that would have gone past. So we have one, two, three, four five, six, seven. So it must be at least seven Sabbaths or seven weeks in that sense. And the next one is to count 50 days. And so let's count 50 days. And this would be the 50 days that we are counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. And so the next day would be the 50th day, right? 50th. And so this day is Shavuot, the, the, the feast of of weeks or what we commonly know as the Pentecost, right? In, 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 uh, in the Greek, right? Pentecost. And so that would be how they would have people counting officially. And hence, remember the rule is seven Shabbats as well as 50 days. And this is how I have demonstrated it. Now, in, in today's time, um, since we're not Jews, if you ever wanted to know when was uh, Passover and when is 
Pentecost or, or Shavuot going to be, uh, we would go to Google and uh, we would have the dates because somebody else would have counted for us. Right? It is difficult for us to count mainly because we are counting based on a Gregorian calendar. And what I've tried to show you is that I've done the compensation for the Hebrew calendar as well. We are back in Leviticus chapter 23. And now we have counted the 50 days. And what is expected at what is commonly, what we commonly understand as Pentecost uh, or Shavuot or the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Harvest. So you shall bring from your dwellings two waves of two tenths of an ephah, and they shall be of fine flour, baked with leaven, right? Baked with leaven. And they are the first fruits to the Lord. Uh, the idea is um, in verse 17, they are considered the bikurim, right? First fruits. Here is called bikurim. To the Lord. Now, first fruits always belong to God. Remember, first born belongs to God. First fruits ought to belong to God. And so they're supposed to bring this. Now, in this case, the first fruits here will be wheat. And that's why you can find baking and flour. This is not barley. This barley, we've dealt with it 50 days earlier. And with this, you are to bring this and we should look at also, Leviticus chapter 2, where this is the grain offering. You should offer the, with the bread seven lambs of the first year. Now, in verse 18, it says seven lambs of the first year. It's actually not lambs. It's seven rams because they are male lambs, right? And the word here is rams of the first year. Not female, but male. Without blemish. And the idea of without blemish is really meaning perfect. Right? Complete. And on top of it, one young bull. And then two rams. And this will be bigger rams. This is just baby rams, right? These are baby rams. These are bigger rams. They shall be as a burnt offering. Now, every time you see burnt offering, you would find it in Leviticus chapter 1. Ola. To the Lord. And it's a very special offering. And then their grain offering, their drink offering in chapters 2 and 3. An offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Why does God want a sweet aroma? Because that is His rules. He wants to have the smell of the fat of the rams and of the bulls and of the rams, right? Uh, and then, uh, and, and, and this is interesting because if you go back and read Leviticus chapter 1 and then it goes on to Leviticus chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7, you find that the fat belongs to the Lord. And God wants the fat because it smells great. Next, this is what is going to happen on the day of Pentecost. You will sacrifice one kid of the goats. This verse 19, and this would be, uh, again, one he goat, right? One kid of the goat would be uh, a he goat. What does that mean? It means it has to be male, not female. So the question that people may ask or you might ask is, why can't we just bring anything? Well, again, I said, God's land, God's rules. God's tabernacle, God's rules. It is what God wants, not what we want or what Israel wants. It is in the land of God given to them so that they can live, so that they would obey God in what God wants to do. And in the feast, it's to remind them 
who God is because it is easy for people to forget God. And so you will sacrifice. And this sacrifice is uh, to slaughter one he-goat as a sin offering. Again, should look at Leviticus chapter 4 to 7. And then two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice for a peace offering. Same thing, shalom offering, Leviticus chapter 3. Right? This peace offering is a shalom, a shalom offering, a completeness, right? One that is of peace in that sense. We call it peace offering. And so two male lambs or so rams. So we have he goats and rams. Very consistent with uh, Exodus chapter 12. Now in verse 20, look at what is going to happen to the first fruits. The priests will wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. And so the pieces of lamb will be waved as well, right? Waved first before the burn. And they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. Remember just now we talked about for the priests. Everything for the priests in this case is about first fruits. And in this first fruits, we were talking about Deuteronomy uh, chapter 26, right? For the priests. Deuteronomy chapter 26. All first fruits are for the priests. And then you shall proclaim on that same day that it is a holy convocation to you. All of you come together. You shall do no customary work. What does that mean? It is a Sabbath. But watch. What about the Sabbath? It is a statute forever. Olam, in all your dwellings throughout your generations, just like the, the day, the second day of the unleavened bread, right? Olam. And so Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot are, is also another such day. Now, I want to point out this to you, and this is a very important verse. This is called the law of gleaning. The law of gleaning. And let me explain this to you. I think the text is self-explanatory. See, in verse 22, when you go for the harvest of your land, you cut everything up. Do not wholly reap. Not entirely. Do not cut every single stalk from the corners of your field when you harvest, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. What do you mean by gleaning? The idea of gleaning in this case is about gathering. You know, when you, when you hold your stocks, right? When you hold your stocks and you harvest your, your um, we'll call it your, your, wheat and barley, as you bundle them together, some may fall on the ground, right? Some may fall on the ground. And the rule here says that do not gather these on the ground. The reason being is that God wants them to take care Leave them for the poor and for the gear. And so I need to explain this. The poor, the needy, the afflicted. Right? And, and I think you would be able to look at who are the poor, the needy, the afflicted. And God says, take care of them. And this is sedeka. This is righteousness in, in the in the Hebrew sense of the concept, that you make sure that they also enjoy your bountiful harvest. 
And where do you read this? In the book of Ruth. When Ruth went to the fields of Boaz to glean, right? So this is the law of gleaning. She didn't have a place to harvest, so she went to pick it up. And the work of picking it up allows these people who are poor, the stranger are the proselytes, people who are not Israel, but joins them. And so Ruth is a gear. Uh, she's a Moabite and she told Naomi, your God shall be my God. And so she goes as a stranger to glean, to collect all of these. And God makes sure that this is righteousness that must be extended to those who cannot help themselves. The orphans, the widows, the poor, the needy, the afflicted, as well as the strangers or the foreigners, the gear who have embraced Israel as their friend and family. Now, we will come to a close in verse 23. Now, in verse 23 is the next. Now, when we pass 22, that would be the May time frame, right? The Feast of Weeks is in the May time frame. And in verse 23, we go on now to the seventh month. And so the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month, a seventh month now, we call it Tishrei. Right? In fact, the month of Nisan or Aviv in the March, late March time frame used to be the seventh month. And God says, we'll make it into the first month. And now when you come to the seventh month, on the first day of the month, remember these are very specific days, right? First day, not any other day. When he says first day means what? At the sunset, when the new moon, you see? The first day of the month where the new moon starts. You shall have a Shabbat, a rest. And in this case, it is a memorial. And verse 24, this would be a remembrance of blowing of trumpets. Now, this whole word is this one word, by the way, blowing of trumpets. And this is called teruah. And teruah is not trumpets, by the way. Teruah is a concept, a concept of, well, let me just put it down. This, this would be a concept of shouting, of alerting, of making noise or sounds, right? Uh, and it will, it could be peace, peaceful. Or it could be a war. And how would the noise be made? By mouth and or by shofar. And based on this concept, uh, this would be a shouting of joy, not war, right? So we have context to tell us this. So blowing off the trumpets is not the meaning of teruah. There is an entire scheme of things, right? They will be celebratory. They are shouting. They are making sure everybody knows. And this is the day. And it is peaceful. And they will scream out at the top of their lungs. And they would blow the shofar. Yes, they will blow the shofar. It's not trumpets. It is shofar. They will gather together. And you will do no customary work. What does that mean? It is a Shabbat. It's a rest. And then you will offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. What do you mean by an offering made by fire? And so go back and read Leviticus chapter 1 to 7. And you will find out all of these things. And so this would be what is normally called the Feast of Trumpets. but we don't have an idea called a 
a feast specifically, but we do know that this is a special day. It is a holy day, and they are to do certain things. And the certain things is making noise, shouting, joy, peaceful, uh, making merry, and blowing the shofar, of course. And by shofar, they would be the ram's horns, or maybe the goat's horns, right? And, and that would be the special event of making sounds. Now, they, they can't simply go and blow the shofar anytime they want because the shofar is actually used as a watchman's uh, device, uh, as a warning, as a signal. And so in this particular day, it is also called Rosh Hashanah. And what is Rosh Hashanah? Rosh means head, beginning. Hashanah means the year, the repeat of the cycle. And this would be the first of the year to the Israelites in that sense, right? It's, it's, it's supposed to be heard as the first of the year in, in more of a, a, a civil year today, right? And it's very specific. And when sunset comes, that would be the new month. They look up to the sky and the moon is supposed to be very, I don't know, just a slither, a, a brand new moon coming out. And that would be the first day of the month. And, and I trust that with this, we would have a better understanding of how all these days come about. Is this an important day? Absolutely. Because it is a major day, a major month, in fact, the month of Tishrei, the seventh month. And we will cover uh, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Tabernacles, and, and, and as we go forward. And so tomorrow, we will cover the Day of Atonement. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.